Hello and welcome to this week's lesson and uh, today our focus is on autism and communication uh, and uh, I am excited to be here today uh, in my new teaching space which is my office which I spent some time over the weekend cleaning up and modifying for uh, your uh, learning purposes and for my comfort. Uh, so um, I've set it up with a whole bunch of really cool stuff so I can show you. Uh, I have some lighting to make it a little more bright uh, for the recording experience. I've set up a nice uh, television in here and um, some other uh, equipment that allows me to make the learning experience uh, exciting and oh, fun for me and fun for you because I get to create uh, these uh, teaching lessons uh, in this space. So. Um, that's a little bit of my office, and uh, and now I will talk about autism and communication. So what are autism spectrum disorders? Autism spectrum disorders are a lifelong neurodevelopmental disorder that affect basically how people communicate and relate to others. Uh, I've met uh, uh, hundreds of people with autism over the years and the 30 years that I've been working with people with autism. And I can tell you that uh, each person that I have met uh, have uh, personalities and communication styles and behaviors that are unique to um, them, you know, their, their, their own um, personal context. And um, the range and intensity of uh, these um, Disabilities vary in terms of the people I know uh, on a spectrum, but all people are affected, uh, have difficulty with uh, communication, learning, and social skills. Uh, and those are the, the key areas that people with autism have challenges with, some more severely than others. Uh, and we can look at autism as being moderate, uh, severe, or profound. Uh, so let's look at. Um, autism in terms of the sort of an overview of it in general. Uh, people with autism have significant impairment in their social interactions and in their communication. Uh, so um, for some people with uh, what we would consider high functioning or uh, mild autism symptoms, uh, they may have a difficult time um, relating to others, communicating how they're feeling, uh, interpreting feelings of others, uh, and somebody with uh, more complex or profound or severe autism might have uh, difficulty um, with uh, communication by having uh, no communication verbally uh, and have a very challenging time connecting and relating with others uh, and um, wouldn't uh, even attempt to. Uh, so the range is there. Uh, people with autism also have restricted patterns of behavior, interest, and activities. So if you look at social interactions, communications, and then you add that uh, layered on this idea of patterns of behavior that are restricted. Uh, so it might be uh, certain um, ways people with autism want things to look or not look. Uh, they may have very focused interests or interests in activities that are uh, really uh, very much uh, focused on uh, the interest of the individual, which we all have, but may not be age appropriate. Uh, and uh, that's um, the, the sort of the main overview of autism. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the DSM, uh, we really look at socialization and social function and communication. And the DSM uh, will tell you that 50% of people never acquire useful speech. And I want to make it clear that I think that people with autism understand other people uh, and uh, certainly have varying degrees of uh, comprehension uh, in terms of uh, understanding the world around them. Uh, some people who don't speak at all are highly uh, intelligent, capable individuals who don't have useful speech. Uh, and uh, also the restricted patterns of behavior and interests uh, for most people are the most striking feature. Uh, in terms of prevalence and features of autism, it's uh, a relatively rare condition affecting 2 in 20 people for every 10,000 people. Uh, so 2 to 20 for every 10,000. Uh, prevalent uh, more in females uh, with IQs below the 35 and in males with higher IQs. So what that tells us is that um, that um, it seems to be that uh, um, 
females tend to have autism more uh, severely uh, or present with lower IQs uh, and males present with some higher IQs if they can be tested. Uh, autism occurs worldwide. It knows no boundaries. Symptoms usually develop before 36 months of age uh, or uh, somewhere in around three, four years old. Uh, autism, 50% uh, of people with autism have IQs in the severe to profound range of uh, developmental and cognitive uh, um, understanding. 25% would test in the mild to moderate IQ range, and the remaining people display abilities uh, in the borderline to average IQ late range. And there are many uh, uh, cases that we hear about of people who have uh, highly uh, intelligent, skilled, savant-like skills, but that's very rare. And so you hear about these individuals uh, and uh, their uniqueness, but uh, the reality is, is that um, uh, like the rest of the population, um, there are very few people who have this uh, very high IQ range and uh, uh, exceptional skills. Um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, uh, language and I IQ performance, of course, better language skills uh, and IQ test predicts better lifetime uh, prognosis. So better communication skills and better ability to communicate and, uh, and, and, and as be uh, engaged in um, assessment would uh, help uh, understand that that person could do better in a lifelong uh, situation. So what about causes of cures? Autism knows no racial, ethnic, or social economic boundaries. Uh, and of course, the overall incidence is relatively consistent around the world. Um, certainly, um, uh, it is, uh, there is no cause, definitive cause or cure for autism, which is a lifelong disorder. Uh, it affects uh, four times as many boys as girls, usually manifests itself, of course, in the first three years. Um, in terms of what causes autism, um, historically, uh, and these are incorrect views, uh, historically uh, it was considered to be bad parenting, uh, perhaps um, uh, speak, uh, speech patterns were unusual and those were the problems leading to autism, uh, lack of social awareness and the copying or echolalia uh, were, were, were the main focuses of autism. Uh, these um, certainly are not true. Uh, poor mothering or bad parenting doesn't lead to autism. Uh, current understanding really is um, that there might be some other medical conditions that are not always associated with autism. Um, we understand that autism has a, a genetic component, but that genetic component, component is largely unclear still. Uh, and um, we do have some neurobiological evidence of brain damage and a link with intellectual difficulties, just disabilities. So uh, neuroscientists can see parts of the brain that may have uh, damage in people with autism versus people without autism. Uh, uh, the cerebellum is uh, size uh, is substantially reduced in people with autism. So there's some evidence there uh, uh, around the idea of a brain and brain structure and neurobiological logical uh, causes for autism. Uh, in terms of uh, psychosocial contributions, the idea that uh, people's experiences contribute to autism, we don't have a clear understanding of, 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 of this contributing to autism, but certainly the psychosocial contributions have a lot to do with how well people with autism do based on the programs, interventions, and supports they receive. In 2007, uh, which is now uh, you know 13 years ago, the uh, Center for Disease Control and Prevention provided a, an addendum to autism prevalence and really uh, looked at a sample of eight-year-olds and concluded that prevalence of autism has risen to one in every 150 American children or almost one in 94 boys. Uh, and um, I think that it's important to recognize that we're talking about a wide spectrum of autism uh, of people um, from high functioning autism, uh, Asperger's, um, social uh, skill deficits, people who suffer some social, social and communication deficits, uh, as well as uh, right across the spectrum to people with complex and profound autism that are included in this idea of having a higher prevalence. Um, 
<clears throat> some common traits of autism include uh, people uh, with autism uh, are, are, are likely to have a harder time and have a res resistance to change. Uh, people with autism may have odd and repetitive uh, motions. Uh, so uh, that might look like hand flapping or rocking or uh, uh, walking back and forth from an object many, many times, feeling as if they were transitioning between two places but being stuck. Um, so people with autism uh, may have a preference for being alone. Uh, it doesn't mean that people with autism don't like being with people. Uh, I know lots of people with autism who live in many of my communities who enjoy being around other people, but also do have a preference with having time alone. So uh, it also depends on the person's personality, but that's one of the sort of common traits. Um, people with autism uh, generally have an aversion to cuddling. I'm um, having a cuddle might make people uncomfortable. Touching sensory issues, um, you know, sensory issues related to touch, feel, smells, sound can impact people with autism and cuddling um, may make people uncomfortable. But I also can tell you that I know lots of people with autism who, uh, who um, especially, you know, um, uh, when they're looking for a cuddle, would be happy to to have a cuddle uh, with somebody they knew well or somebody that they had a relationship with their parents. So, um, you know, uh, that is uh, true for some, uh, maybe most, but for some others, maybe not. Uh, people with autism have a hard time making eye contact. Uh, and uh, that's a, one of the things that I'm working on for you as students as I'm working to teach you is the idea that this is my eye contact with you as opposed to looking off to a side or a screen. Uh, people with autism may you know, not want to look at you. You may have to prompt them to say, hey, look at me. And then they look at you and you can certainly teach the, the skill of looking at somebody. Uh, that's, um, but the making eye contact is challenging. I, I once had a student who's graduated from our program now who had autism and he told me that um, when he looked at people it was painful for him to look at people and he didn't know what to, to do when he looked at people and I said to him well you know people like to be looked at when you're talking to them as opposed to talking to them while you're looking off at the staring off to the ceiling or looking down at the floor or looking off to the side and never making eye contact and he said I just don't know where to look and I told him that he should look right here in the middle of somebody's uh, uh, forehead above their nose you could always look right there and you'll be okay and this changed his world that I told him where he could look when he talked to people and uh, this is somebody with a real high functioning autism very uh, capable young person who's certainly doing great things in the world now but certainly learned the one idea that he could look at somebody in their eyes by looking in the middle uh, so that's just something pointing out to him that helped uh, so um, People with autism sometimes have inappropriate attachment to certain objects, uh, objects of, uh, of their own particular desire, sensory uh, or interest, uh, you know, especially uh, young teenagers with autism, boys and girls who become older, who start to continue to have objects that might not be age appropriate or objects that have meaning for them that may not be meaning or be uncomfortable for others. So this is certainly something to be aware of. Um, people um, with autism may have a hyperactivity or an underactivity. So that's a, that's a sort of a paradox. Somebody who's over uh, overactive and running around and being really, really um, engaged in everything around them in a sort of hyperactive kind of way. And then um, the other alternative is somebody who's more lethargic and quiet and slow and sloth-like and may have uh, movements that are slow and precise and steady and maybe um, not as um, uh, hyperactive as the alternative example. <clears throat> Um, people with autism have an over or underactive sensory responsiveness. So what we're talking about sensory responsiveness, we're talking about the idea of light, sound, uh, smell, taste, touch. Uh, these are our senses uh, and um, people with autism would have uh, either an over or under uh, active sensory responsiveness. So, so for example, in a very loud situation, somebody with autism might laugh and not clog their ears, but in a very subdued situation, where there might be very no very no sound that we are aware of, they might cover their ears and be very uncomfortable in what we think is a quiet space. Or alternatively, of course, crowds can make people with autism uncomfortable or loud noises 
hands or clapping in other situations as well. So be mindful of the sensory response. And that goes to smell as well. And smells in rooms and places and touch and feel uh, can be a problem. Sweaters, zippers, uh, f the feel of fa certain fabrics may be not right uh, or just right. Uh, and or taste uh, and textures uh, being uh, something that with people with autism have a, a over or under active sensory responsive to or are responsive to. Um, people with autism have uneven gross or fine motor skills. So we're talking about fine motor skills being the little movements that we do, the big movements we make being the gross motor skills like grasping objects or dressing themselves might be challenging uh, for somebody uh, with autism doing up a button. Uh, so the skills of doing these things need to be worked on and taught uh, as well. People with autism repeat monologues, words, uh, and uh, this repetition of monologues and words certainly uh, can sound odd and strange to others. Uh, it might be part of the experience and the conversation that that person's having uh, in their own in their own experience with them with themselves. It could be songs they like, words they like, meaning that are connected to songs. Uh, sometimes it sounds sophisticated, and uh, other times it sounds uh, like gibberish. Uh, and uh, it is uh, hard to weigh through what this repeating of words and monologue means, but it's certainly functional, you know, uh, maybe not functional communication, but communication of some kind uh, and or stim interest and or ways of self-talk uh, uh, that help somebody um, get through the day to day of their life. Uh, so I know somebody with autism, for example, who uh, when um, he knows he's done something uh, that um, is not the correct way way to respond. He somehow talks in his sort of mother's voice uh, where he says to him, you know, the mother will say to him, hey, you know, smarten up, you got to do the right thing, right? Uh, and you have to shake his hand and look in his eyes. And so he, he has this monologue he plays that you can tell it's not him. It's sort of like his mother or a teacher or somebody that was saying, this is how you do it. And then he goes and does it. So uh, sometimes monologues and repetitions are prompts and other times they're stim and interest. Laughing, crying, or showing disinterest for unapparent reasons is another sort of common feature of autism. So you might have somebody with autism who in a happy situation might cry, in a sad situation might laugh, in any spontaneous situation laugh, cry, and show distress uh, or happiness in any given time for no apparent reason, and that's uh, not uncommon. And then you may, you know, somebody with autism might be un very unresponsive to our verbal cues. Tantrums, aggression, self-injurious behavior is is something that is um, some uh, you know very much part of um, the experience of people with autism, but not all people with autism and not all people with autism have aggressive or self-injurious behaviors all the time or may have had them in the past and certainly have grown to become young teenagers or young adults without uh, these behaviors or may have them in different ways. But uh, I can tell you that my work in the field that I'm in really is working with really uh, complex and severe, hard to serve, hard to place people with autism and having aggressive behavior and tantrums is certainly something that we experience uh, caring for people with autism but not all people with autism have um, behavior and tantrums all the time uh, and as, of course the skill and support that we provide as caregivers around uh, this uh, individuals who uh, learn communication skills and functional communication skills and adaptive skills to be able to live and learn in the world certainly impact um, how individuals with autism communicate how they are with others and how they behave uh, and one of those ways is to improve the quality of uh, communication so that we have less people becoming aggressive or unhappy in the world of autism. And that's a goal all across the board uh, to teach skills in communication to improve quality of life for people with autism.